Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Colby Pitts. I'm the Florida Friendly Landscaping Coordinator for Hernando County, and I'm here with Master Gardener Bernie uh, over at the Extension Office, and this is the weekly virtual plant clinic. Um, Dr. Lester won't be joining us this week, so uh, it's the madhouse with Bernie and I. Um, so if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the comments, and we will do our best to answer them. Uh, Bernie, did you have anything specific you wanted to talk about uh, well, this week? Well, really, I, uh, uh, I had uh, a client this morning with a uh, scale problem on uh, a coon tea, and uh, it's one of those things where the, they have been fighting this for a while. The, the cycads tend to be a problem, and uh, I, I felt it was probably time to go with a systemic, so... Uh, I recommended a metacloprid. We'll see how that works out. Uh, uh, I really don't normally like to uh, use the neonicotinoids. Uh, they they tend to kill bees if, if you've got a flowering plant. So uh, this is a great time because <laughs> excuse me, uh, they don't flower. It shouldn't be a problem. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, and I found out right before. Uh, what was that word that you used um, to describe aminocloprid, uh, the category? Uh, neonicotinoid. A neonicotine uh, mm -hmm. family chemical. Uh, and Bernie and I talked about this right before we started. And I, didn't, I didn't know that. Um, I looked up nicotine is actually toxic to insects. And so herbicides like, or I'm sorry, pesticides like aminocloprid are made to mimic nicotine. Uh, I suspect the in, insect ingests it and dies. So that's that's interesting. It's kind of there's a lot of those herbicides that are made um, to mimic naturally occurring chemicals like nicotine, and um, because I think sometimes it's easier to mass produce certain where where they're they're you know it's one one carbon atom different or one there's a different uh, ion somewhere else in the in the atom and it's or in the molecule and it's super easy to to mimic it but maybe it might not be as easy to produce the natural version of that uh, of whatever chemical you're talking about there's a ton of uh, I think a lot of pesticides and herbicides work that way by making something that's really close that mimics some other natural process just it, it either overloads it or the active ingredient functions slightly differently I know um, with like glyphosate that's a one thing I want to say it's like a, a metabolic inhibitor that the plant will take up thinking that it's some part of its uh, some part of its um, respiration cycle and then it it in fact is not and the plant ends up the plant ends up dying uh, super super interesting how all those uh, herbicides and pesticides work yeah I, I had heard that uh, the the development of roundup came as a result of looking for a product that would slow grass uh, growth so that they didn't have to mow it so often you know if, if you've got a big commercial factory someplace and uh, five or six acres of grass around your property uh, it, it becomes a nuisance to maintain the, the grass when it has nothing to do with the, the product you're producing. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, that represents uh, over the whole country a big market if you had such a product where you could just spray it and now we only have to mow the grass two or three times a year and uh, we save money and, and manpower and just a big, big place to, to make money for the, the chemical companies. And the product didn't work very well because it killed things. And uh, it turns out that we also needed a, a non-selective uh, herbicide and, and Roundup became a, a really, really popular thing. Now they have plants that uh, are genetically altered so that the uh, Roundup doesn't affect them. Mm -hmm. And uh, we go out and plant soybeans. And when the weeds start growing up in the soybean field, you just go out and spray Roundup. It doesn't hurt the soybeans. Gets rid of the weeds. So the beans produce twice as much that way. And oh, yeah. I think, 
I think it wasn't, I don't know, 10 or 15 years after they, Monsanto came out with Roundup that they came out with the crops, which in the span of, you know, uh, genetically modified uh, plants, that's pretty quick. Um, it was almost like they had it in mind. Because uh, they, uh, they got like soybeans and corn and everything else that is made by the same company, or it was developed rather by the same company that developed the herbicide, which I think is kind of interesting. Yeah, the, um, the, we, neo, the neonicotoids, um, I think 1999, amitacloprid was the number one worldwide uh, pesticide. And because of the, the problem with bees, uh, a lot of countries have, have banned the use of the neonicotinoids. And, and the, the neat thing about that family is, uh, in my case, grand, my grandfather, but in, you know, I'm a little older, but uh, most people, their, their grandfather or their great grandfather probably used a, a nicotine juice, tobacco juice, uh, in the garden to, to kill mm -hmm. insects on the tomatoes, for instance. So, uh, you know, it, it's been around a, a long, long time, and, and some of those old-timey things uh, still work pretty good. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them uh, really don't, but uh, it, it's just amazing how uh, the, the the problems that we face today really are, are just the, the same old problems mm -hmm. that, that they faced a long time ago. It, it's just that we have put together big mammoth monocultures of, of plants. And uh, when you have a problem, you have a much bigger problem because they, they all the plants have the same problem. So yeah, and they end up they end up having a resistance too to a lot of it. Um, so I know, I know that's the case. Like those bugs will, you know, they they evolve much quicker than you know their lifespans only days, weeks, or something. So they they're going through generations and generations. They'll go through you know fifty generations in a year. And their evolution's a lot faster, so you end up with them having all kinds of resistances to everything you throw out in a matter of years. Where, if if you know a human or something would were to go through the same amount of evolution, it'd take a hundred thousand years just to develop some kind of uh, resistance. There, it looks like we have a question uh, from Monique that says, "I know you've talked about this before." Bernie, but what are the steps to deal with take all root rot? I know the mower height is a factor. Uh, I've got growing areas that are dying. Okay. The, the take all root rot, the, the fungus is there. The, it's a situation where the uh, grass exists, uh, not in harmony necessarily, but with, without any ill effects, as long as it's healthy. The uh, fungus doesn't appear to attack it. but once the, the lawn is under stress, then it's a problem. So there's, there's several things you need to do. Uh, the, the one is, is that you have to eliminate as many stresses as possible. And second, if you know that uh, take all is a, a problem, you, you should treat for it a couple of times a year uh, on a prophylactic basis rather than uh, uh, trying to cure it, it's, it's much easier to stop it. Once it starts, uh, it, it really is a problem. You, you need to treat with a fungicide, and there are only, I believe it's six, that are effective. And uh, you, it becomes uh, used to it really quick. So you can only use a, a, one of these fungicides twice. And then you have to change to a different product. And and the initially you're treating every month until things stop getting worse. And then when they stop getting worse, it, it's probably under control. But the the thing that makes it really bad is that when you notice it, let's say you've got a a, a four foot spot in your yard that, that is showing the the problem. Well, that means that probably a high percentage of the yard has been attacked and you lose a, a tremendous amount of root structure in it and it's possible uh, for the, the leaves to stay green although there's no root structure 
uh, for another month. So uh, what you see today is not how the damage is going to be a month from now. And uh, so even if you start treating, it's going to get worse. And that's, that's why I say you have to treat every month until it stops getting worse. There's a, a publication that the university has on take all root rot. It lists the uh, chemicals that are effective. Uh, you can uh, Google it under take all root rot UF. And, and that's a real neat thing. If, if you add the letters UF uh, after a subject, if the university has any publications on that subject, uh, those are the first things that pop up. So the University of Florida does have a great publication on take all. Uh, if, if you believe you have take all, uh, the areas that are dead don't tell you much. It's it's the transition area you want to look at. So go out and in, in a, in a spot where it, it, it's green on one side and brown on the other side. Dig up a little piece about the size of a brick and about an inch deep and uh, clean the, the, all the soil off, look at the roots. And, and if the, the roots are uh, a dark color and, and uh, there's no little hairs on them, uh, you've probably got to take all and, and, and you really need to treat immediately because if, if it gets to the point where you have spots that are covering a third of the lawn, the odds of being able to get that to recover are almost non-existent. It, uh, at, at that point, so much more is damaged, it, it, it won't recover. So uh, Monique says that she's looking for a uh, natural solution, and I'm imagining she means uh, not uh, without chemicals. Uh, um, and that, that, you know, it, it's possible. If, if the uh, damage is extremely small, uh, the, the thing that's bad is right now we're, we're ending the growing season. So uh, even if you do everything right, it's not going to grow out of it at this point. Um, but, the, the, you know, if, if you have a, a fungus problem, and you don't treat it with a chemical, there, there's no natural thing that's going to stop that fungus. The, the only thing that happens is if you can get the lawn itself healthy enough that the remaining lawn... It doesn't uh, show the effects because you're, you're never going to get rid of it. Yeah, but the, 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 that's really difficult to do when we're not in a growing situation. You know, if, if, if you start... If, if, if the lawn's still in existence, uh, in March, you know, if, if you haven't lost too much lawn in March, and by too much, I mean less than 10% of the lawn has a problem. Uh, make sure the mowing height is good, make sure the watering is good, uh, make sure that the fertilizer is good. It, it's it's bad in that if, if there's, there's a widespread problem, it, it needs fertilizer, but if you put fertilizer down, you put a lawn that's in super stress in grow mode, which is a st another stress, mm -hmm. and, and it doesn't really help. Dude. Uh, you know, it, you actually need to fertilize at about one twentieth the rate you would normally fertilize, and and fertilize fairly often. You, you, I hate to tell people that because people will immediately go out and over fertilize. This this is a situation now where you cannot fertilize the lawn at a normal rate or or all you'll do is speed up the process of it dying. You you really need to use one of those fungicides. And the fungicides uh, are are not really a problem. They're not killing things, uh, but they do stop the fungus from attacking the plant anymore. Uh, I, 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 is one of the, the keys. That's uh, what is in some of the Scott lawn fungicides, propiconazole, oxystrobin. Uh, there, there's several of them. There's six of them, and yeah. they're all in that publication. I, I do think when um, I, I think that sometimes the the chemicals there, especially I think fungicides and 
uh, I, I think you have to look at, so, so every chemical that you buy, that, that you can buy from anywhere, has what's called a safety data sheet. Um, and I think if, if even if you're like normally against your chemicals, get that and read that safety data sheet um, and like learn about the chemicals because I think that saying, oh, all chemicals are bad all the time is I personally, I just don't think that's a realistic uh, I'm not. I'm not telling anyone what to do, but I don't think that's that's a good way to look at it because water is a chemical. There's there's chemicals everywhere in everything, and some of them are necessary uh, for for anything to function, uh, any life to function. So really, I think when you're dealing with something like take all root rot, where there's not a lot of treatment options other than um, other than fungicide, I think you really need to look and see, hey, this is where this one's from. If it makes you feel any better, this is where this one's from. These are the effects. This is other places where it's used. And I, I think that's, for me, that's how I look at it. Um, and reading those safety data sheets and reading about the potential effects, uh, it, it kind of might mitigate some of your, some of your concerns. Um, she asked about black cow, which... I think that's a fertilizer. Is that manure? Yeah, that's a that's a uh, uh, powderized uh, cow product. Yeah, well, that's I mean that's that goes back to fertilization, I would imagine. See, that that that's not going to solve the problem, and and the sad part about it is once you know that 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 is a problem, you really need to treat at least once a year to prevent it, and it, if you. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, every time the lawn gets stressed, you're going to be back in the same situation. Yeah. Um, I was at uh, a class yesterday, and uh, we were talking about this. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's like Roundup. Roundup is, is a product that pretty much anything you spread on, it dies. But Roundup is only absorbed by the green parts of the plant. Uh, you know, if you've got a tree there and it gets on the tree trunk, it doesn't hurt the tree at all. Mm -hmm. If it gets on the ground, it's not absorbed by the roots. Uh, the uh, little microbes in the soil uh, disable Roundup so that Roundup has a really short half-life, a couple of days in the soil, and it's gone. Uh, there are other herbicides that are really, really poison that, uh, that don't die, that don't disappear. And they end up in the, the drinking system. So I am, mm -hmm. I am a, a big promoter of what you use is really, really critical. You, you don't use sledgehammers to drive fingernail or thumbtacks. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's let's, let's use an appropriate product. Um, unfortunately, we have a very limited number of products uh, for take all and uh, you know, if if we're killing insects, and and we we've, we've got uh, the ability to use horticultural soap, or seven or malathion, uh, you know the soap makes good sense. The soap is, is not a, a a problem at all. The malathion ends up in the drinking water, so uh, you 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 know you have to decide is is the, the cure worse than, than the disease and in this mm -hmm. case the cure isn't worse than the disease the cure isn't all that bad the, these chemicals although they are in fact chemicals they're not major bad chemicals mm -hmm. but uh, you know uh, this, this is something where you only have very limited choices the the biggest thing is that you have to keep the lawn healthy mm -hmm. and and once you have this problem, you know, if, if it's just started and it's minor and and next the season, the grass is in perfect health, it'll grow out of. It. But if, if it isn't in perfect health, it just gets worse. And, and if and, you it, uh, preventatively with one of these chemicals uh, early in the season, at least it'll make it through next season without getting worse. And, and that is a problem, you know, uh, St. Augustine grass grows about 18 inches. Run, the runners move about 18 inches in a season. So if, if you had a hole that was, say, three inches, 
or three feet that in a, a growing season, you could fill that back in. If you kept it free of weeds, it, it would actually uh, recover. But you're not going to be able to keep it free of weeds. So all these spots that show up are going to end up being filled with weeds instead of grass. And, uh, you know, you, you really have to do something. And it, it's much worse than it looks. You, you have to remember that. It, uh, if, if you don't do anything, the damage will be probably doubled. And if, if you treat it, the damage will probably only be 50% worse. If, if you don't do anything, it just continues getting worse and worse. That, that is a, a terrible thing to have happen to grass. But it's, it goes back to this thing of grass is, is not something natural in Florida. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's not a product that wants to be here. I, I think that the St. Augustine thing is kind of neat. St. Augustine grass originally was found at a monastery in, in St. Augustine, Florida. They don't know what the origin of it is. Nobody knows where it came from. But it was a grass that was growing in Florida where there aren't any native grasses that do that. So with uh, some research and, and uh, the University of Florida and the University of Texas A&M worked together and, and developed Floritam. And the word is uh, the FLO from Florida and the TAM from Texas A&M. So that's where Floritam comes from. Mm -hmm. so. um, I, had a, I had someone that spoke to me about take all root rot and said that he was just going to dig it up and sod it. And I had, I'm sorry to say, that will not work. Um, if you saw it over, I mean, at some point, if there's no grass left, that's one thing. But when you saw that, when you put that sod down, you that sod is now, it now has to call root rot. That's just how that works. It, I mean, maybe not showing the effects yet, but that fungus is present. The way that it, uh, that, take all root rot spreads is by it grows the fungus grows out and these little shoots they're almost like runners in a plant they're called uh hyphae and they grow out and then when you dig it up i mean you might take some some of the fungus out sure you broke off that hyphae and it's still out there just growing um so just to, if you have a hole a take all root rot spot that's dead in your yard and you just dig it up and saw it over it that doesn't really that's not really solving uh solving the problem and i just wanted to mention that because uh i have i've had it's happened more than once uh, since i've been here people have asked me about it and said well can i just saw it over it and the answer is no it, that doesn't really fix the problem actually in our county it's there that mm -hmm. if, if you're in hernando county the fungus for take all root rod is in your property and it, it's one of those things as like i said as, as long as the, the lawn is healthy uh, it gets by, and it, and if the lawn is mostly healthy, uh, the the effects of take all are not all that bad. But it's mm -hmm. as soon as the lawn is stressed, you you start seeing the problems. And and once the problems get a good foothold, they become really big problems. Oh, look at the this. Uh, look at one of the stolons underneath the microscope, mm -hmm. and there's all these little black dots. And, and then there's a little tiny black line connecting the black dots to the little runners. And uh, it'll, it'll look like a, a map of, of some heavily populated area with all these little dots for cities and, and these little roads interconnecting everything. So uh, it, it, it's so easy to, to tell uh, what the problem is. And, and it's so often diagnosed. Most of the lawn services still diagnose it as chinch bug. So, uh, unless you actually see a chinch bug, don't believe there is a chinch bug <laughs> in the lawn. I guess over yeah, in the eastern part of the, the state, uh, they're starting to have chinch bugs. Uh, they've, they've got some new St. Augustine varieties in the uh, the chinch bug population is moving up. Yeah. And uh, it was definitely a stressful year.
for plants. It was so hot. The hottest times of the year were so hot. And uh, I know it's been, it's been pretty dry lately as well, which that, you know, that, that makes, that's a perfect storm for uh, plant stress. That's for sure. Yeah, we, we did have a, a really nasty summer in, in, for the plants. Mm -hmm. um, something I kind of wanted to mention. Uh, next week, I'm going to do a class about, the UF calls it petscaping. But really, it is making, it, it's, it's considering your pets while in your landscaping practices. That's, that's kind of the gist of it. Um... And one of the things I want to talk about today is having your dogs and cats outside and what that does to um, the local, your like local ecology. Uh, something I learned a while back, I was I actually learned this on a podcast. Um, cats, domestic cats and feral cats, you know, Felis domesticus or whatever the, Felis catus I think is actually the domestic cat species name. They, um, they are the most efficient hunters in North America. Out of out of any any species, it is domestic cats. They I, I saw the statistic I saw last night was that they um they kill over a billion plus every year of birds, small mammals, amphibians, and they, I think their population is in the uh, maybe right over a hundred mil or in the in the in the hundreds of millions, probably approaching a billion, but of all of those categories, they kill at least a billion of them each a year, which is crazy. And um, that has like a market effect on the environment. Um, when you kill all the birds, you know, those birds are providing all kinds of services, eating insects, for food for other bigger birds and other animals. Um, and your cat that gets its uh, fancy feast at the house doesn't really need to eat doesn't really need to eat the bird that's outside. Um, they also, the, the, the cat doesn't do it because it's hungry. The cat does it for fun. Um, and it's, it's, I know that a lot of the, uh, a lot of the humane society, humane societies and the SPCAs, they all recommend you keep your cat in the house. And, um, Cats being in that, like, the cats that are outside, you know, they're more susceptible to disease. I, I, if, if it's like if it lives outside. I don't think if you let your cat out in the yard or something uh, every day. I don't, I don't know about that. But if they're living outside, they're more susceptible to disease, injury, uh, parasites, the whole nine. And I think they live longer uh, if they're inside cats. And with dogs, dogs are much less efficient hunters than cats. And they're, they're trying to get different stuff. But a dog will run off animals, uh, and this is more in, like, the small mammal space. They'll run off these animals, and the animals will come back. They're like, there's a big, scary predator over there. I'm not going back to that yard. Um, and that kind of eliminates. It, it's, re it's really just good to think about that kind of thing. Uh, think about the ecological services that are provided by the other animals in your area when you're putting your cats out, cats and dogs uh, outside. There's also uh, a lot of Florida plants that, that I see all the time that are um, toxic to cats and dogs. Uh, we, we, Bernie and I talked about this earlier. A kunti, and the kunti seeds will take out a dog. Um, I, and not very many of them. So I, I think a lot of the recommendation is like as soon as you see the kunti seeds, just uh, pick them off, throw them away. Um, let me think. I think uh, lilies and azaleas. Lilies are toxic to cats. I think azaleas are toxic to dogs and cats. Just something to think about. Um, but you'll hear more about this next Friday um, in my petscaping uh, Facebook Live class. That really is a problem. In fact, the the, the uh, university has a publication on um, poisonous plants for horses. <laughs> Because there's so many pasture plants uh, that that'll poison horses, so mm -hmm. uh, everything needs some way to protect itself. And and you know, if, if you're poisoned, you survive longer, but it it uh, doesn't do those around you any good. Mm -hmm. The uh, 
I know like the you know tropical soda apples. Those those are not good for cows, but they're in every pasture. Um, around when I was at Swift Club, we treated a whole lot of TSA. Um, but I, I know that that's something that we would do uh, to cow pasture back home. We'd, we'd get out there once every couple months and go out and either pull them up or spray them, what have you, uh, to get rid of the, the, those tropical soda apples because they're not... They are, uh, they're not good for, for cows. Um, air potato. That'll, that is toxic to you and your pet. Don't eat air potato. Not a good idea. Um, I think all of the lantana varieties are toxic, I think. Yeah, I don't like lantana. That, that's one of those things that gets spread and really gets out of hand mm -hmm. in a hurry. Um, one, one thing to keep in mind is coming into the winter season, you know, usually we get our first freeze frost, whatever, between Christmas and New Year's, which is, you know, six weeks away now. I just I don't know what happened to this year. But uh, if you have plants that need to be protected, uh, you know, you need either freeze cloth or some uh, blankets or sheets or something to put over them. The idea is to build a little tent. It's the heat out of the ground that gives you the protection. Don't wrap them up like a lollipop. Doesn't do a thing for it. The, the plants don't generate any heat themselves. But the big question is, how do you save some money doing this? Answer. Now's the time to run around to all these little uh, surplus or salvage stores or, or used goods stores and, and show your Christmas spirit. Some, spend some money there and buy old blankets and old sheets and things and and you can get them dirt cheap and then use them to protect your plants if you wait until time to need that you need them one it's hard to find them then and second uh that you're in a panic mode when you're trying to do it so now is the time to buy your covers for the plants make your your decisions on how you're going to do it uh get a few bricks or blocks whatever to hold the, the covers down, uh, maybe some poles to uh, support them so that, uh, you know, you can keep them up off of the plants. Uh, if, if you have small plants, a cardboard box upside down over a plant, uh, pull the flaps out, stick it down on the plant, put a, a concrete block on each one of the, the flaps. It's perfect. It, it holds the heat. Uh, it, it's a great size to uh, keep the plant covered. You know, so start thinking about these things. The, the the bad weather will be upon us, and it, you know, when when they say, "Oh, tomorrow's going to have frost in the morning," but you already got your stuff. Yeah, yeah. Then then you think about it, and it's too late. So, uh, yeah. some some free game there from from Bernie. Um, we got another question. How do you protect a large tree from freezing temperatures? That's really easy. When it, when it's a little bitty tree, if it's going to be damaged by freezing temperatures, you plant it in Miami. You, you, you cannot protect a large tree. And, and the fact that it's a large tree almost always means that it's protected. Now, that, there's mm -hmm. some exceptions to that. Um, there are... Uh, some trees here in the county that should not survive that, that are really big and they're in a microclimate where uh, things just happen to, to click and they just make it but uh, as, as a general rule any large tree uh, is, is not going to have a problem if, if the tree has stood there since the 80s it's been through the, the worst weather it's ever going to see and, and it will not be a problem. If, if the mm -hmm. tree got large uh, in the past 15 years and it shouldn't be here, now you're going to find out why it shouldn't be here. You cannot protect large trees. One, one thing that helps, but it's only a little bit, is to thoroughly water the, the ground around it before uh, the freezing event. The uh, water holds more heat and the ground will release heat longer. But it, if we get into this 18 degrees for 18 hours thing, uh, 
the tree either survives or it dies, and there's nothing you could have done to, to alter that. I thought for a second you were going to say a really, really big sheet. Yeah. <laughs> but, all right. <laughs> but, I mean, that's, uh, you have to, you'd probably have to go to a bunch of Goodwills and do a bunch of sewing to get, <laughs> to get a sheet that big. Um, they made uh, a, a teepee type thing with a big plastic zipper that goes over trees. It's good for trees to like six feet or seven feet, something like that. Mm -hmm. And it makes a little tent and, and you, you pull the zipper down after you, you put it around the tree. Uh, it's, it's got little foamy stuff inside so that uh, there's no real contact, no heat conduit to the mm -hmm. outside so you don't get uh, burned right where it touches. I thought that was kind of a neat idea, except they're they're fairly expensive. Oh, of course. Maybe I think something. any, like when you look at like protection for stuff, especially protection from things that are pre like not preventable, um, everything is expensive because they're like, well, what are you going to do? You have to. You have to or it dies or you have to, you know, whatever. Um, that's crazy. Um, one of the... Um, Places down at Sarasota that has some tropical trees. Uh, a few years back, actually, it's gotten to be quite a few years back now. Uh, we had one of those uh, in the teens for a day, and and the tree was going to die if they didn't do something. Mm -hmm. And they they put uh, four uh, heaters underneath the tree. <laughs> And, and the tree got some really serious damage. It took it, um, I don't know, two, three years to recover. But it, it would have died if they hadn't done that. So, uh, you know, if, if you can sustain some damage to the tree and, and, and you want to keep it alive, at, at, uh, no matter what the expense is, uh, if, if you had heaters under the tree so you can keep the basic tree going, uh, you could keep it alive, but uh, it, it's going to look pretty bad because mm. everything that, that doesn't stay warm is going to get burned. Yeah. I remember being a kid, you know, 18, 20 years ago, and, and my grandma, it would, it would be like the first time that you could wear a jacket outside, and she'd be outside covering. She had like aloe plants and... Um, it's hard to remember now. She had rose bushes, and she'd be out there. And it's like, Nanny, it's 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 not that. It ain't that. Uh, it ain't, it ain't that. It ain't that cold. But I don't. I also don't remember anyone doing a lot of covering, uh, in the past. But then again, we do live in Florida. Well, the thing that's happened is that the the people that are planting the tropicals where they shouldn't are the people that move here. And, and they're not in a tropical part of Florida, but mm -hmm. they, everybody thinks that Florida is, is a, a monoculture, it's tropical, and, and you should be able to have uh, coconut palms and, and all those things, orange trees, all that stuff right outside the door. So uh, th they move here from the, the north, uh, they go to the big box store, the big box store gladly takes their money and sells them a bunch of tropicals, they go home, they plant the tropicals, and they all die. And what do they do? They run back to the big box store. And buy more. And yeah. Buy a whole bunch more tropicals. And I know this because I am poster child for having done that. Uh, <laughs> man, you talk about being stupid with spending money on things that <laughs> I, I should have never bought. Uh, but that's why they have an extension. That's why I'm mm -hmm. here now. Because I made all these dumb mistakes, and, and if you call me, I'll tell you some of the dumbest things that you could possibly do. And, and they're coming from knowledge that I gained doing them myself. Why should you have to be an idiot when you got your own personal idiot here with the work for you? Uh, let, let, let Bernie bear that cross for you. So d d don't, go, don't go buy your tropicals at the big box store. Uh, <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> Uh, I think it, it uh, is we are a subtropical climate, which 
I know it sounds like we'd be under tropical, but on the northern hemisphere, that's over tropical. Um, so you're trying, I mean, like, you, you get, I think you get places that could be considered tropical in, like, South Florida. Probably, I don't know, Coral Gables and lower than that, maybe Fort Lauderdale and lower than that. You can have, you might, you might be technically tropical. But I know, I know they just revised the, uh, the plant hardiness, uh, map and almost all of Hernando County is now 9B except for a little patch I should actually show it um, there's a little patch that is still 9A that's in Spring Hill I think or maybe maybe in between Brooksville and Spring Hill on the west side of 41 I'm gonna I'm gonna find it real quick because because I saw this I was like I didn't even really think about them actually updating it but but they did. Um, let's see here. Yeah, you know, the the problem is we're nine B for seven to ten years out of twenty, and then boom, we're zone eight or or zone you know. Yeah, we we become zone eight for uh, a weekend, and and it does a tremendous amount of damage. Yeah, so this is the new. I don't know how it's a little bit different, but if you, it's kind of funny. So Hernando County, as it, as it loads in, is right here, and. The whole thing is uh, is 9B. This whole county, except for, I uh, imagine this is up towards, uh, like, oh, this is 41, so this is Brooksville-ish. Or Bur yeah, it's over here. But then you have this other little 9A area down here, just, just in between... Um, the Sun Coast and 41, and uh, I mean, but that's the thing is like even though this says um, that this is 9A and the rest of it's 9B, it's all you know pretty close. And roll that up a little bit so we can see where the next division is. Oh, it's down. It's it's coastal because I know if you see this this uh, 10A, this 10A. In the last map, we had some 10A down here on coastal Hernando County, but now that 10A doesn't go. It's it's way down here in Tampa and St. Pete. There's a little bit on, I guess that's like Newport Ritchie, but it's it, it's it's much further south than uh, than Hernando County. That's for sure. Yeah, I, I find then, it interesting that uh, Orlando. Is warmer than we are, and and Orlando really is warmer than we are. There, oh yeah, almost ten degrees warmer. Yeah, well, there's no, there's no, you're not getting any sea breeze. I I I, I lived in Orlando for a year, and I I went to school there for four plus years, five years, whatever, and it, uh, man, it got hot, and it was like a stifling, no wind. When it was hot, man, it was hot. And I wonder, I'm not a, I'm not a meteorologist or anything, but I, I don't know why that is other than it's, you know, further away from the coast is the only reason I can think of. But like we mentioned earlier, like your tropics, that's, that's down here in this, you know, when you get to 11A is tropics. It, maybe a little 10B, but... You're you're gonna have a hard time uh, growing those tropical plants up here in 9B. You're you're just not gonna be able to do it. And if you look up your plant, the plant you're trying to plant on, uh, if you look up, type in the name of the plant, type in UF, there there will be a article about it. And it'll tell you what places it'll grow. And uh, if it says, oh, this only grows in 10B, well, you're probably not going to be able to grow it in 9B. Uh, we had a question, can we grow coffee trees uh, 
in Central Florida. I don't know much about coffee trees. I, I think the answer is they, they don't produce coffee. It, it, it can be done. The problem is the humidity is too high in the summer and, and uh, the, the crop is, is really terrible because of it. As far as growing the, the plants, uh, there are some coffee plants that will grow here, but they, they don't produce edible coffee beans. I know we have a an invasive plant, wild coffee, but I don't think it's actually a coffee plant. I just know that. Um... Got its name from the uh, original settlers actually using it in, in place of coffee. So. Mm. And I, th I think it's one of those um, where it's it's native, but it it is invasive in particular environments because that's that's an interesting an interesting um, what is it a di like distinction is that not all invasive plants are exotic and not all exotic plants are invasive. Um, those there, it, there's a Venn diagram and it's, it's kind of really close together, but, um, you can have native plants that are invasive to a particular environment and you can have exotic plants that grow just fine and don't cause, don't cause any issues. But I remember we had in one of our areas at Swift Mud, we, we had to, to take out all the wild coffee because it was causing an issue, but I don't, it, that's been a few years ago and I don't remember exactly, um, exactly why that was what it what we were what we were actually doing it for but there was a reason um yeah it's it's uh it's um it's kind of crazy i didn't think they i didn't i didn't realize they updated it because I, I figure it doesn't change very much but there you go what do you what do you know about growing uh green tea here But yeah. I think that. Yeah, I think tea can be grown okay. You know, the, the, the thing you have to remember is, is although a lot of plants, uh, where our temperatures are, are close to where they, the, the plants are in nature, we have very warm nights and we have very high humidities uh, all the time. So uh, the things that, that grow in the Mediterranean climate, which is similar in temperature, daytime temperatures to what we get, mm. uh, they, they are a low humidity and a lower nighttime temperature. And uh, it, it makes a dramatic difference. There, there are plants that, that you can grow here. They just don't grow very well. They're not very happy. And you know, if, if, if you are from Arizona and, and you come to Florida, Florida's hotter to those Arizona people because they can't stand the the eighty percent ninety percent humidity. Mm -hmm. and it's the same way with the plants. If if you can't grow a people here, why should you grow a plant here? The, yeah, the same thing. So the, the the temperatures aren't a problem. It it is the other factors that go along with it. When the temperatures are what they are, and the the humidities and 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 the general rainfall, you know. It's uh, it's really interesting. If you look at a lot of um, invasive plants we have here, a lot of their countries of origin are at the same latitude as we are, just opposite over. Because uh, if you look, uh, like, um, pepper trees are, are not not really one, but like coca grass, that's from the Philippines. Uh, you know, South Asia. So many of our plants that we have that are issues here are from South Asia because South Asia has a very similar climate to Florida. Because if you think about it, they're on the same latitude. Um, old world climbing fern, same thing. Uh, so you, you you can really, it, that really just goes to show that it's not just the temperature. Because if you think about it, what the Mediterranean is, they're, they're up a lot further than we are on the on that because we're down by you know closer to africa on when it comes to 
uh, if, when if it comes to latitude. East, if, if you go east from here, uh, our 28 degrees latitude, you go right through the Sahara Desert. Mm -hmm. So 28, well, well, 28 degrees is pretty far south of, of Europe. Yeah, but and you do go through the desert, but that's uh, I'm I'm not at liberty to discuss the ecology of why deserts happen right now. But there's there's rainforests that are in in Africa that are similar, uh, or rainforest ish, you know, very lush environments that are very similar in latitude here uh, to us. And then you go across when you have places, uh, you know, the Philippines, um, Vietnam, those areas are all. Uh, super similar climate, and that's why we have so many invasive plants uh, from places like that because the climates are so similar. I think we're gonna begin wrapping up here. Um, if anyone has any more questions, please feel free to put them in the comments. And as we're wrapping up, we'll try to get you an answer. Um, if for anything uh, that the extension's doing extension website uh, right there um, I believe it's it's linked to their Facebook so anytime that they post anything it'll be there and there's their phone number if on Thursdays you have a question that you can't figure out well Bernie's your man he'll be there on Thursdays to answer it um, be sure to visit the Master Gardener Nursery over in Brooksville, it's behind the uh, behind the fairgrounds. Uh, I know that they're beginning a speaker series there that I know I'll be participating in uh, next month. On I think it's Wednesdays and Saturdays they'll be uh, they'll have speakers there. Um, for anything, a any of the videos we post, um, I think end up on this on the Hernando County Government uh, YouTube channel. So my live classes that I do uh, and any recorded videos I do ended up end up over there under the Florida Friendly Landscaping um, uh, playlist. Um, and if you have any questions specifically for me, my email is copits at hernandocounty.us. And all of my socials and all of my programs are right here. Linktree slash Hernando FFL. And... Uh, Cindy says, thank you. Wishing everyone a happy Thanksgiving. Well, happy Thanksgiving to you, too. I know we will not be here next week uh, because it will be Thanksgiving. So I know I'm not going to be here. I don't think Bernie's going to be here either. I think he's going to take the day off. <laughs> I, I would uh, like to, to throw out one last thing. Um, okay. Talking to some guys yesterday, and they were talking about they were going to fertilize their lawn for the last time. It's really too late to fertilize things. Every everything that is out there in your landscape and growing pretty much wants to go to sleep. Uh, so, it, unless you're fertilizing your your little garden plot, uh, don't fertilize anything else. It's it's done for the season. Uh, stay inside, enjoy it, drink a hot toddy or whatever, and uh, uh, just. Let it go. You you're pretty well done mowing. You know, may have to mow one last time, but that that's the wonderful part about this season. Uh, if if you if you want to, you can just totally forget doing anything out outside through December till after Christmas. Uh, if if you need to do uh, some pruning of, of your plants, I recommend that you wait. And uh, most things that uh, are pruned when they're dormant. Uh, you can go uh, up until February. So uh, until after the new year, you don't have to touch anything. Um, trim your plants then in, in January, February. And remember that in Hernando County, you cannot fertilize, you cannot turf fertilize from uh, December 15th uh, through March 15th. Now you can still go buy fertilizer. However, you cannot fertilize um, until after March 15th, from December 15th, and you shouldn't be fertilizing anyway. Um, in December, not going to do you much good. And have a happy Thanksgiving, and we yes. really appreciate you being there, because if there wasn't anybody there, we wouldn't be here either. So. No, I would just drive over to the extension office if I wanted to talk to Bernie. Um, 
So happy Thanksgiving to everyone. I uh, hope everyone has a great next week holiday, and I'm uh, thankful that everyone joined us uh, today. So we will not see you next week, but the week after, I'll be here. I imagine Bernie will be here, and I assume uh, Dr. Lustro will be here as well. So thanks, everybody, and uh, have a good one.